Hi all, I have a fascinating and instructive game to show you today, Tata Steel Masters, the great Magnus Carlsen, current world chess champion against Nikita Vuchikov. Let's have a look at this game. It started off with the classic Roy Lopez, so Magnus is playing white, knight f3, knight c6, no surprise here, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, white castles, bishop e7, d3, b5, bishop b3, d6, and now bishop d2. This is very, very interesting. Usually Magnus has played a4 in various high-level games against Wesley So, against Sergei Karyakin, against Topolov. a4 has been the choice before, and they've varied you know, in their responses, like rook b8, bishop d7, or b4. Uh, so against Wesley So, um, with bishop d7, Wesley So actually managed to win that in Leuven 2018. Uh, the other two, uh, Magnus uh, did very well and beat both of his opponents. So a4 is tried and tested, reasonably good results. But he plays bishop d2. So at first glance, this clearly prevents knight a5. Sometimes there's another upside little perk here that we've vacated the c1 square. So sometimes maybe queen c1, this battery could be useful, if there's, especially if there's a target pawn on h6. So a very interesting move, bishop d2. It has been seen before. Black castles h3 preventing a pin which might be annoying h6 that is a potential target especially if there's a battery that h6 pawn rook e1 rook e8 a3 so giving the bishop a nice hole on a2 a nice square on a2 which would preserve this pin on this f7 pawn and I think one of the interesting themes about this game is this this bishop on this diagonal should black really make an effort to shut this bishop down. Uh, I think that's the particular angle I'd like to take on this game. Uh, so watch the progress of this bishop and, and various resources designed against it. It is one of the more dangerous uh, pieces in the position. And even from you know a club player's point of view, it's a nice pin on the f7 pawn. And unpinning maybe should be a, like considered a major strategy in its own right. Um, so this uh, is interesting. So bishop f8. We have knight c3, so not, not bothering with some sort of plan with c3 and d4, which is often seen, but rather uh, bolting down the d5 square with pieces. Rook b8, the bishop goes to a2, we have knight e7. You might think, well, what about the tempo gaining b4? a takes, knight takes b4, bishop b3, should be safe enough for the bishop. Sometimes there might be a little trick with knight takes d3 if the queen's not indirectly protecting b3. But other than that, this should be a fine position if white handles this with care. And even in such a case, there's always bishop f7 check here. Uh, so that should be a fine position. So anyway, we have actually knight e7, so not going in for that. <coughs> and a curious move here, which which provokes weaknesses, it seems, fundamentally. Uh, can you guess what Magnus played to try and provoke some weaknesses from Black on the king side? Okay, five seconds, 100 points for this little provocative move. Knight h4, yes, at this moment, knight h4 is pretty interesting. So preventing knight g6, because then knight takes g6, and that pin pawn comes into play. There'll be no recapture. Just to put that on the board. Uh, so we have to do something about this pin, surely. So, and if black plays king h7, then f7 drops. So it's a real nuisance bishop. If g6, then this aforementioned battery is useful. Queen c1, nifty. What does black do? If king g7, we just snap on h6. If king h7, that leaves f7 behind. We just take on f7. So, yeah, it's it's a pressure position where it seems there's not too many moves uh, here to do something about this pesky knight. Uh, and the thing is, you know, it might follow up with queen f3 and it might get even more annoying, you know, then knight f5 under the better circumstances. So black elected to kick this knight immediately. It creates weaknesses, of course, in the long term. Uh, pawns don't go backwards, and there's still this mean pin here, which uh, black should maybe try and address. We have uh, knight g6 now. 
if black tries to celebrate that aggressive pawn with g4 here, the knight could simply go back. And this scenario could be luscious uh, for a G file attack, for example, like this, where white can build up for a potentially major, major attack on that G file. This is just a fictional continuation where black's getting torn to bits with the G file as an issue. So uh, knight G6, not G4, trying to keep solid and aggressive, knight H2. And white's play is clearly, uh, there's targets on light squares here with fancy knight maneuvering. Uh, the first one is this to knight g g4, but there's also knight e2 to g3 to f5 potentially, and there's also queen f3 with combination of the knight movements to the light square. So f5 and g4, nice little strategic targets here for white. We have c6 being played now knight e2, so ideas like knight g3 and poking into that f5 square because pawns don't go backwards. We have two pawns sitting here on dark squares which can't really influence that f5 square now so if a knight lands there it's difficult to kick it. We have d5, knight g3, d takes, d takes and here uh, black played rook b7. This might be a critical position for trying to basically unpin this nasty pin here on this diagonal. Black could play potentially it seems c5 here to try and close in this bishop, shutting down this bishop as a kind of tactical and strategic priority. Nimzovich did after all put pins in both the tactical and strategic category. Is it not worthy to do this? This seems as though this might be the best uh, course of action. If knight h5 takes takes, threatening queen takes g6 check because of that pin, the, the pin could be shut down and it shouldn't be too many uh, issues here for black. Say this position. This should be fine. It seems black's going astray here a little bit, not really uh, trying to shut down this bishop with a huge priority, and plays this move rook b7. Just kind of defending f7. Okay, coming to rook d7 seems absolutely lucrative as well on this d file, but there's a tactical move here which Magnus plays. Can you guess? Okay. Queen f3, kind of tactical, just looking at f6, saying if queen takes, I'm going to take on f6, and threatening queen takes g6. We have knight f4, just to show some variations here. Queen takes d2, queen takes f6, threatening the nasty queen takes g6. If knight f4, then this is very nice for white, just taking on c6 there. There isn't too much punishment. And what does black actually do? If queen d6, then knight h5, the queen's not going anywhere on f6. And this is a real nuisance position for black, as in uh, can get completely lost and tied up here. For example, this default, this is a fictional scenario, but basically why it's got such a huge bind on both sides of the board, this kind of thing is going to break through eventually. Okay, this is a long example, but you get the idea that black is kind of tied down there. Uh, on queen d7, yeah, queen takes g6. On bishop e6, uh, this is also another way to play the position, going in for this pin against the bishop there. And with these knights poking into light squares, this is actually pretty nasty stuff. There, there's check. And if the rook doesn't move there, uh, say taking a pawn, then there's check there, exploiting that pin. And things get nasty, yeah. Overall, white's doing much better. And that bishop is just miserable in this structure. Okay, the knights are running rampant on the light squares. So we have knight f4 being played instead of taking on d2. Now rook a d1, threatening bishop takes f4. Clearly, the queen or something has to get in the way of that rook d7. We have bishop e3, inviting bishop e3, inviting exchange of rooks, queen e7, knight g4, knight takes which helps white a bit it seems, h takes, even though it's double pawns, this is a really nice clamp on f5, rook d8. Magnus preserves his rook, it might be useful in this h file later. c5, finally this idea, you know, c4, potentially, knight f5, queen c7. It's difficult to consider here bishop takes because actually this knight's a liability after g takes to g3 to try and trap this knight. And if something desperate like h5, then maybe it can be snapped off. And the bishop in time goes to d5 here, much more superior than that bishop on f8. Big advantage for white. So we have queen c7, g3 now, knight e6. And now a really neat move for Magnus. Can you guess what he plays? But it might not be the best. 
black hatch thing after knight e6 has got you know in theory knight d4 might be useful in theory c4 might be useful there's two moves in theory here yeah which you know maybe black should uh celebrate and white by contrast should shut down uh these two possibilities in some way for example c3 or bishop d5 to shut down the effect of c4 but no magnus plays queen h1 which looks really lucrative it does but it might not be the best so maybe this should be given a question mark a question mark exclamation mark slightly dubious if c3 instead it reserves the right uh of queen h1 without any use by black of the d4 square so for example this position looks very interesting as well using that uh h file the bishop can come here White could build up later on this h file putting a rook to h1 after the queen moves somewhere so that would be very interesting and also bishop d5 uh to stop the effects of c4 this is also another idea leaving very very nice pieces for white and white should be uh, with a nice edge here but queen h1 black uh really um played a disturbing move here maybe exhaustion of the tournament maybe fed up hasn't been uh happy with his games in this tournament or something has gone wrong psychologically i believe with vodjakov at this point in the in the game it's like maybe he feels a bit worn out or something this move here f6 uh so it's not great it weakens the diagonal it amplifies the bishop it immediately gives a pin knight there are there are options here for black which maybe are are interesting uh the first one uh for example king h7 is not so good white could take on e6 and then take on g5 because that dismantled g5 the knight's not protecting there that's pinned this this is a disaster for black so forget that but what about c4 shutting down this bishop and you might think well hold on the whole point of queen h1 is this threat black can't get away with positional moves and just lose material like that surely it turns out here that black has a resource in this position even though okay one pawn down he has shut down the bishop and there is a resource in rook d6 and if white tries to go for this other pawn it slightly backfires after rook g6 remember we've we've shut down this pin on f7 this is now possible without queen g6 and here uh you know black actually is fairly okay is going to get that pawn it's fairly okay so that's interesting um f3 is a bit weakening i wouldn't really want to do that so <laughs> yeah it's 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 an interesting position uh so this is really what uh black should have gone for it seems but also let's look at knight d4 instead of c4 if bishop takes d4 then black gets this e5 square in this case which actually is tactically useful for example here bang rook takes d5 and that's the end of white there but of course uh white could uh improve here um after bishop d5 queen e5 uh there are options but black should be fine here this this is also a more much more active position uh, a way of playing it if c takes uh that's going to be a small edge for white with that h file usage but it's better than the game continuate continuation the these ideas are better than f6 this is a bit passive and we have bishop d5 and black does seem totally fed up after this i think he can envision uh intensity uh, the intensity of the h file with queen h5 king g2 rook h1 and black's pieces are really passive this bishop is now a massive piece on d5 this shouldn't have been allowed and maybe kind of disgusted with himself in some way it seems i don't know he resigned here <laughs> it requires some explanation this possession uh because it's not it doesn't seem as though it's immediately lost but yeah black resigned here after this move if knight takes h6 bishop takes queen takes queen g7 queen h3 c4 now shutting down the bishop for example um Ah, uh, sorry. This this is <laughs> part of me. Magnus's move avoids the bishop being shut down. If if he had taken on h6 instead, this was a great move. Yeah. If he had taken on h6, then we see the bishop still being shut down. Pardon me. And uh, White would uh, 
only be in trouble if he got his queen trapped. If he actually retracted the queen here, then he has got uh, a clear advantage, and that pawn chain can be undermined. But so Magnus's move does actually respect the idea of c4, it seems, as a priority. So what does black actually do here? If king h7, though, how does the game unfold potentially? So king h7, as an example, queen h5, bishop g7, c3, to shut the knight down a bit. Queen d7, rook d1, bishop b7. This is just an example. Uh, it would show white having uh, domination of the position and maybe winning material like that, as one example goes. Uh, so bishop d5 it's actually it's actually pretty tricky here this position uh, if queen h7 b4 is pretty nasty uh, black's got a bit of an overload here trying to support h6 and c5 so this is a bit of a, a stretching move for black if c takes in fact here bishop b6 is interesting for example, like this, that would win material. When does the rook go? If it goes to e8, then we're back to a takes b4. And white is torturing black here. Black doesn't really want to lose the h6 pawn. If h5, then taking, this is going to secure an advantage. There's the nifty c3 possible in this position. And if bishop takes, then rook c1, b4, then there's knight d6 absolutely crushing with this bishop because if the rook moves then there's knight takes c8 I'll just put this on the board and then e6 drops so there's disaster scenarios like that if we go back here um, so after bishop b6 if rook e8 a takes b4 it's uh, it's getting as though black's getting asphyxiated <laughs> basically it's it's pretty grim if white's going to play a move like c3 then there's all sorts of opportunities on both sides of the board. Black's really without counterplay. It's, it's one of those positions lacking in counterplay. It does require a lot of uh, explanation, really, to the spectators. It seems as though Vichikov was, was just really, I don't know, down on himself. But uh, he did have resources in the position before that bishop d5 occurred to either shut down the bishop or to use the d4 square. So, yes, a surprising uh, resignation to many here after this bishop d5 but maybe more surprising is it, it, there should have been resources against this getting this kind of no counterplay position in the first place but anyway it's magnus's first win in tatar still and i thought i should definitely cover it and he's had a very very long uh run of not being beaten he's setting a new world record for that as well every time he's not beaten in this tournament so um he's continued though to with this game with a win so i hope you got something from it i think lessons for club players and me maybe sometimes you know shutting down uh, a bishop can be a strategic imperative even if you have to sacrifice a pawn or two even shut down these dangerous bishops otherwise you're just gonna be tortured by them uh, for the rest of the game they're gonna have nasty implications all, all around the shop later okay uh if you want to play me at chess world check out that bitly link bitly chess world there's leela videos that uh bitly leela chess Okay, I hope you check those out as well. Thanks very much.